Our third speaker this morning is Dr. Elizabeth Marsh. She received her BA in psychology from Drew University and her PhD from Stanford, where she worked with Gordon Bauer and Barbara Tversky. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis, working with Henry Rodiger. Dr. Marsh is currently an associate professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke University, where she has been a faculty member since 2003. Dr. Marsh's research interests span the field of human memory and include autobiographical memory, memory errors, and student learning. We spent some anxious hours this morning trying to pin down a little known interesting fact about Bath, and we settled on the fact that she expressed utter shock that people would ask Pooja if her twin brother was identical or not. <laughs> Please help me welcome Dr. Beth Marsh. Hello. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, so I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and I thank everyone here at McMaster for hosting this event and being um, such a welcoming host. Um, today what I wanted to talk about um, is the problem of student misconceptions and how we can go about correcting them. And Pooja actually set up very nicely at the end of her talk this issue that we need to think about um, how to give students um, feedback. And so that's what my talk today is going to be about. So we all know this. Our students have some wrong beliefs and they make mistakes. So my first example, I'm just going to ask you to remember that this data comes from American students. Um, so for example, um, many of our American students think that Toronto is actually the capital of Canada. Um, you know, people, pardon? <laughs> um, you know, people hold beliefs that um, raindrops have that particular teardrop shape you often see in cartoons and other, other pictures, um, even though that's not actually the case. Um, you know, uh, basketball fans are believers in the hot hand um, and the idea that people can get on these streaks. Um, you know, or it could be um, just kind of a, a standard mistake where a, a student makes a mistake when solving a problem, um, and that mistake could be a calculation mistake, it could be a more conceptual mistake, um, but bottom line, they get the problem wrong. And so what I want to talk about today is a little bit of the research about um, what you should do to try to help people um, with these misconceptions and errors, because our goal should obviously be learners um, that have an accurate knowledge base. And so, um, as I already alluded to, I'm going to talk about feedback today and the role of cor correcting errors. But if all I say to you is give feedback, it's not very helpful um, because I could be referring to, um, uh, you know, just marking things as right or wrong on a Scantron. I could be referring to just giving a letter grade. I could be referring to giving a very long explanation of the correct answer. Um, I, when do you give people the feedback? There's a lot of questions, and I think when you start thinking about implementing a lot of the things we know from cognitive psychology, where people get stuck sometimes is in thinking about um, how do I actually go about doing this. So what I'm going to do today um, is I'm going to give you um, the first part of my talk, which is the longest part, um, so that you don't think when I get here that I'm going to run out of time, um, is I'm going to give you some examples from both the laboratory and the classroom looking at error correction. Um, and then I'm going to do um, talk a little bit about the, what information the feedback can should contain and when it should be given. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think this um, sets up a number of future research questions. So, um, you know, the example I'm going to, the laboratory example I'm going to start with here, I've picked um, errors that people make with high confidence. Um, so our, our Duke undergraduates actually do make this mistake with high confidence. Um, and the question, and these are the, the beliefs that you would think should be the hardest to correct. Because these are things people are holding with high confidence. And so the question is, how able are they to update when you give them the feedback, telling them the correct answer, and then later on um, they're, they're asked this question again. Um, and so, 
what you're going to see here is this is how confident people were originally, and this is um, their ability to correct that error on the second test. And what you typically see, um, this is a, a something that Janet Metcalf calls the hypercorrection effect, although these particular data are from my lab, is that people show that um, what is to cognitive psychologists the surprising finding um, that they're actually more likely to correct these errors made with high confidence than ones made with low confidence. And again, that's surprising from our perspective because you would think that these would be the, the beliefs um, that are strongest um, in memory. And this is a finding that has been obtained many times um, with lots of different materials um, across populations. So for example, in my lab, um, we did a study with second graders where they made their confidence judgments using this kind of scale here um, so that they would understand the confidence scale. And you get a similar kind of pattern um, with the little kids um, as you do with the college students. And I don't want to go um, too much into the theory of this today. Um, I have a whole talk on that. Um, but, um, but basically, um, there's a couple dominant explanations out there, but at least one of them that I'm a fan of is this idea that when you find out that you're wrong, when you really believe something, it's a little bit of a what moment that you're a little bit surprised and then you pay more attention to that feedback and that increased attention to the feedback helps you to remember it later on. But, you know, we all know it's not as simple as this. Um, and so, um, you know, the data clearly suggests um, that, you know, from old interference theory that, you know, things come back, basically. Um, and so we did a study looking at this um, where we, we were using science misconceptions. Um, so things like the idea that um, camels have uh, water in their humps or that, um, lakes look blue because they're reflecting the sky, or that vitamin C actually prevents um, cold, cold. So we collected a whole bunch of these um, kind of misconceptions um, that um, are a little bit more interesting and, and require a little bit more explanation than things like capitals. Um, and then we do the same kind of study where we ask people the questions and get their confidence and give them feedback. Um, but the key thing here is um, how long do you wait before you ask people these questions again? And so what you should see is you still see this is the confidence in the initial error, and this is ability to correct it. So you still see this general pattern. But what you should be noticing for present purposes is forgetting, obviously, that with a week out, you're not going to remember as many of these corrections. And that sets up the obvious possibility that what you're going to have is resurgence of earlier errors. So people don't repeat their errors very much when you're testing them right away. Um, but when you're testing them a week out, um, they're more likely to, the, the errors start coming back and there's actually a trend um, for them more, being most likely to um, reproduce those high confidence errors. And this is an issue that you see, um, you know, I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I tend to be in this particular tradition, but if you look to education research, um, you look at the conceptual change literature, that much of that is focused on immediate testing. And obviously, you have to be able to correct something immediately, because if you can't change someone's opinion about it right away, then it has no chance of surviving over the long run. Um, but the question is, you know, how do you get these things to stick over the long run? And that's where a number of these things have been much less successful. So what I want to talk about are some new data um, collected by my postdoc, Andrew Butler, and my graduate student, Sharda Umanath, um, trying to, to make these corrections stick a little bit more over time. Um, and in this case, um, we wanted to um, move away from um, these simple laboratory materials and actually go into a classroom um, and correct um, misconceptions there. So what we were doing was taking advantage of um, kind of what what I would call the standard way that um, misconceptions are refuted in the literature. And it actually seemed a lot like Bob and Veronica's um, um, t um, kind of your most powerful version of 
dispelling, pe trying to dispel people's beliefs um, about blocking in that, you know, this method would involve kind of presenting people with the misconception and giving them an explanation of why it's wrong and telling them what the correct information is. And that has some success, but again, it's more relatively um, immediate. And what we want to do is see if we com combine it with our friend that we've heard about in many talks, um, spaced retrieval practice, and see if we could get the correction to last longer um, that way. So these are introductory psychology students. Um, the data that I'm going to be showing you today from our first study are from intro students at Drew University. Um, we have two studies ongoing this term, um, which I can talk about later, um, an introductory psychology at Drew and also at Hendricks College. Um, and um, what we were targeting um, were common false beliefs that intro psych students hold. So this may horrify you, but things like that hypnosis um, can help you recover memories, that crime rates increase when there's a full moon, um, and you know that there is a link between vaccinations and autism. Um, so these are the kind of things um, that we were looking at, um, and I think we had like 30 or 40 of them. Um, and so um, basically what we decided to do was myth busting. And so um, the way we worked with an instructor to um, keep some time at the end of intro site classes for fun myth busting. And they did, and I'll, get, I'll show you what that means in a second, but they did um, two myths per class and everybody got to see the myth busting. Um, and then what's different is what happens after the myth busting. Um, and so what everyone sees is, is information like, for example, on autism and vaccines, that there's not actually good evidence for this linking, um, and actually also gives um, a possible explanation for why autism rates may be changing over time, um, having to do with um, things like changes in the DSM um, and uh, awareness of the disorder. Um, and so they're given, um, oops, oh, and then they finally are given a bottom line that partly the change in diagnostic criteria has partially um, responsible for increased rates of prevalence of autism. So like I said, everyone gets these kind of um, um, slides and the instructor basically teaches them um, to to miss and, and, and bust them. And then one, that's all they do. Um, and then the other one is um, also gets this, but they also get the space retrieval practice. And what that means is that periodically during the semester, they get to retrieve the reality. Um, so they get asked, you know, a question like, um, what single factor has been instrumental in causing um, the, ma the recent massive increase in the prevalence of autism? And they do receive feedback on that. They do this on, they just get these quizzes sent to them electronically, um, and they're very short, and I believe they just count toward the student's participation grade till they're low stakes. Um, and then we have a final test, um, and in this particular study, um, we had two semesters of intro psych. So the fall semester, the final test is always was around Memorial Day. So for the fall semester, the delay is on the order of like six months. And for the spring semester, the, the delay is on the order of a couple weeks. Um, and what I want you to see, this is ability to answer final test questions about these myths. Um, and what you can see is that um, this method um, um, does help the general refutation. Um, they're able to correctly answer about half the questions, um, and there is a little bit of forgetting. And the question becomes, does it get better when it's paired with this retrieval practice? Um, and what you're going to see is it's particularly good in the short run, but even though there's forgetting, it now makes these people um, who are now doing it delayed look a lot like the spring people who are taking it immediately. Um, you can look at whether or not they actually produce the misconceptions, um, and what you see is that about um, a fifth of the time they do, um, with only the PowerPoint slides, um, and that that drops um, when they've done the retrieval practice. And again, there's um, some um, forgetting over time, but, um, but we still have effects. And so what we're doing right now is doing things like um, an experiment where we have the read-only control um, and, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so what I wanted to do with these two examples 
um, is to give you some examples of um, how, you, how you have to think about how your students are processing the feedback. You need feedback that they're going to attend to, um, and you may need them to revisit and retrieve this feedback over time um, to get the most bang for your buck. Incidentally, I will say um, that when, when, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but that one problem I think in an educational situation is actually getting people to look at the feedback. Um, and, um, and so that's why in this case, um, it did use a little bit of class time, but it ensured that everyone um, looked at it. So um, what I want to do uh, briefly now is talk a little bit about what information the feedback should contain. Um, and there's lots of different feedback you could get. Um, and so there's definitely been a distinction in the literature between just marking something as right or wrong versus giving people the answer. And both of the examples that I gave you earlier um, at least gave people the answer. And Hal Paschler has um, sh done some really nice work showing that when you just tell people if their answers are right or wrong, it doesn't really help them to correct their errors. And why should it help them correct errors? Because you didn't give them anything to replace their errors with. Now, the one exception to that rule um, is some work that I've done with the Bjorks, actually, um, looking at multiple choice testing. Um, many multiple choice Scantron machines actually have an option, a switch that you can choose between, whether you're giving, um, just marking them right or wrong, or actually giving them the answer. Um, and for multiple choice tests, if you just mark them right or wrong, um, it helps some although not as much as answer feedback. And that's because if you know that you got something wrong on a multiple choice test, it helps you to winnow down the other choices and you get basically some partial feedback. Um, but the examples that I gave you earlier, um, the example of just saying what the, the capital of Australia is, that's an example of answer feedback. But in the myth busting case, it was a heck of a lot more than answer feedback, right? We gave this refutation method is about explaining to people um, why um, this particular thing is right and the other one is wrong. So it's basically giving people um, an, ex an explanation. And um, we, all, we all feel like that that is a really good thing. But there's a lot of data when you actually look at it in isolation that doesn't always show that you get much additional um, for giving explanations. And so I just want to talk about a little briefly um, before turning to my timing data um, about when you might, when that explanation is going to give you kind of bang for your buck. Um, and in particular, it's going to depend on what, your, you, what you want your students to do later on. Okay, so I'm going to tell you briefly about this one experiment because I want to make sure I have time to get to my last point. This is done in collaboration with my postdoc, Andrew Butler, um, and this is a laboratory study. Um, and in fact, I think John already described these materials for me last night where people are reading passages, um, for example, about bats. Um, they take an initial short answer test, and I'm going to give you an explanation of what this is, but they can either just get no feedback, they can receive the correct answer, or they can re receive an explanation of why that answer is the correct one. Um, critically, that explanation doesn't provide any additional information that wasn't already in the text. And then the key thing is that later on, they're going to get, on the final test, they might get the exact same question again, or they may get a transfer question that asks them to apply their knowledge in a new way. And the thing, the reason why this is key is because if you think about it, if you get the exact same question again and it's the same answer, why would you need anything more than the answer um, to be able to succeed there? And so we think part of the reason why the literature has not been very supportive of the power of explanation feedback is because it's doing these kind of repeated questions. So, you know, an initial test question might ask people to retrieve the name of the sensory ability that bats use to navigate the environment and locate prey. Um, and then they either get the feedback that just tells them the answer or they get elaborative feedback that just takes information from the text that explains it. So it's not providing any additional information. Um, and then either the exact same test question or transfer question. Um, so for example, an insect is moving toward a bat using the process of echolocation. How does the bat determine that the insect is moving toward it rather than away from it? Um, and what you see is uh, when you have the same test questions, kind of what you would expect, 
here's your benefit of feedback. Feedback's good. Um, this is correct answer feedback, and the white bar's explanation feedback. So it helps, but there's no difference um, between these two bars. But when you ask people to transfer their knowledge, um, that's where you're getting the benefits um, of the elaborative feedback. So when thinking about what type of feedback you want to be giving your students, it's partly going to depend on what your goals are for the learner. Are you just, are you just trying to get them to kind of do the retention level, then answer feedback is probably okay. But if you want them to transfer their knowledge um, to, new, to new situations, that's probably when um, you want to take the time, um, because it does take more time um, to give them the explanation feedback. Okay, so the last part of my talk talks about when feedback should be given, um, and I'm going to intersperse in here a little bit of comments about technology as well. So when should you give your feedback? Um, so, you know, it, it may surprise you to know that the empirical literature on this point is actually kind of mixed. Um, you know, there's an old tradition kind of from Skinner perspectives that you should give feedback right away because you've got to stamp out that error and not let it kind of hang around. But then there's actually been a number of, of, of very impressive demonstrations um, that delayed feedback, especially in laboratory settings, can be really helpful. And the idea is, is almost then that it's a spacing effect and you have to reprocess the information more, it's harder um, when it's delayed um, than when it's immediate. But the literature is quite mixed on it, um, even though um, I feel like depending on which reviewer you get, they're really sure that one of these is right. Um, and um, Furthermore, the beliefs of people may be at odds here. And so um, partly with the scientists, it's going to depend maybe on which literature you're more entrenched in, because in the kind of cog psych literature, I would say the pendulum swings toward the delayed feedback. But in classroom studies, it's the other way, so that there is mo you're more likely to see the benefit of the immediate feedback. Um, I think educators often believe in immediate feedback, and students do. And one of the big push that you see now when you're talking about MOOCs, these massive open online courses, is that one of the things they're promising is immediate feedback. So this is just taken from Coursera's webpage. Um, and they're stressing that, you know, um, that it's a, it's a problem when the instructor moves on to the next topic, um, and that people get feedback weeks after the concept was taught, by which point the student barely remembers the material and rarely goes back to review the, co the concepts to understand them better. In the Coursera platform, we typically give immediate feedback on that concept. So this is a real selling point um, of many online platforms. Um, so we have a series of experiments, but due to time, I'm only going to tell you about one of them today. Um, this is another classroom experiment. Um, this is an upper-level engineering classroom at the University of Texas, El Paso. Um, and um, kind of like what Pooja was saying in her talk, this is just kind of in some ways a drop in the bucket. This Having not done a lot of classroom research before, I am like constantly amazed at how many things are going on, some of which I find out about after the class is done. So um, they're doing lots of things in the classroom. They're going to lecture, they read text, they watch videos, they do simulations outside of class, they have exams, they study for those exams, and they have weekly problem sets. Um, and that is the only thing that we can impact are the weekly homework assignments. Um, these are the kind of homework assignments these students get, so I hope these will convince people that this is complex material. Um, these are the kind of things they're being asked to do. Um, um, I sh this is probably obvious, but we didn't create these materials. Um, these are the instructor's actual course materials that we're working with them on. Um, and um, this is where I'm going to digress just slightly. Um, we're doing this intervention via a platform that we've been building in collaboration um, with engineers and computer scientists at Rice University. It's called OpenStax Tutor, and it's a cyber learning system that has been built um, specifically to allow cognitive science research. So it's a platform that actually has a barrier in place between the educator and the researcher so that the educator can see everything and the researcher can only see um, de-identified data 
only from students who have consented um, and the consents in the system and everything. And then you can build into the system, you know, what kind of parameters um, you want to have changing in these kind of homework assignments. Um, and so again, in this particular study, um, we are manipulating the timing of the feedback, but there's lots of different things that we can, we can um, manipulate. Um, and we have classrooms using this system at Georgia Tech, UT El Paso, Claremont, McKenna, Rice, and Rose Holman. Um, so we have everybody put their homework in the system, regardless of condition, just so that there's no difference from people and like, you know, that they're not used to the system or something. Um, and the system is going to deliver the feedback. I do believe that automating um, some of these things is going to be necessary in the future if we don't want to put a burden on instructors. Um, and the way it works in the system, and um, I don't have an engineering example for this, um, but the way the system is currently built is they get a question, um, they get to answer their question, um, their response in free form, and then we have a multiple choice option. We wanted to build it so it had both the free form and the multiple choice um, to get the benefits of retrieval practice, but also the automatic grading that's possible with multiple choice. Um, right now we're interested in whether or not turning off that free form response is actually going to make a difference. Um, so um, the, there's two manipulations in the one study that I'm going to um, finish with today. Um, one is the timing of the feedback. So it's either immediately after the homework deadline or one week after the homework deadline. I actually think one week is pretty good response time when I'm grading. Um, so, um, so I want to be clear though that it's after the homework deadline. You can't make it immediately after the problem is solved because then somebody does it early and gives the answers to everybody else. So it's immediately after the homework deadline. Um, and then we had a second manipulation. Um, we thought that maybe part of the reason for the mixed results between um, classroom and laboratory studies um, might have to do with the fact um, that when you're in the laboratory in these delayed feedback experiments, normally you're kind of forced to look at the feedback. Um, whereas when I give, it actually makes me really sad. Like I write all these comments on these final exams and nobody, Nobody comes to pick them up. Nobody comes to look. And so in a classroom situation, one advantage of immediate feedback may be that people actually look at it, whereas by the time you give them their paper back three weeks later, they've kind of moved on and stuff. So we did want to also manipulate um, whether it was optional and the student could decide whether or not to do it, or whether it was required to receive credit for your homework problems, okay, so that they had to do it. And I will say that, um, Happily, they were more likely to look at the feedback, but it wasn't perfect um, when they were required to do so to receive credit. Um, in this study, this is um, between subjects and the, uh, between sections, sorry, there's two sections of the course, and this one is immediate, and we've done this kind of immediate, uh, sorry, within, within a class. So on one topic, you get immediate feedback, on another topic, you get delayed, and it's counterbalanced across subjects. Um, but we also have a between subjects version. And so what I want to show you in these data, this is performance on exams, okay? So this is not a measure that we made up. This is the actual engineering exam performance. And I want you to notice two main effects, basically. So what you should see is that forcing people to look at the feedback does, in fact, help them to perform better on exams. Um, and the second thing that you should see is that they did better um, when the feedback was delayed um, than when it was immediate. Now, we didn't actually get out our interaction here that we were looking for, and we have a number of ideas about why, and I can talk about that if time permits, but I think I'm, I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to move on. Um, but what I want to show you is that we had this data, and this kind of lines up nicely with um, Bob's talk, where um, we had a longer survey, but I'm just going to show you um, a couple data points. Um, what students thought of this, and specifically, I'm going to show you um, the proportion of students that um, um, picked the numbers over here, meaning like I, I wanted to receive the feedback after a delay and I think I benefited from receiving the feedback after the delay. So um, what you see here is that um, nobody um, had a preference for delayed feedback 
and almost nobody thought they benefited from delayed feedback, even though, of course, their performance shows that they benefited from the delayed feedback. And in fact, in our initial study, the instructor called us um, because um, her students were really freaking out, um, and they really hated this. And they thought it was like not fair that sometimes, you know, to, to have to wait for feedback. And she was like, should I change my whole course? And we're like, no, no, please don't. Um, so the student, so this is, is, is kind of ties into Bob's talk that, um, and you would think they would get their, they would get their midterm, they, they had multiple exams in the class. So like in Bob's study, they had some opportunities to observe which topics um, they were doing well on in exams, and this is a measure at the very end of the course, and they didn't like it. Um, so, you know, we have not tried to overcome that at all, um, but it's another example of this kind of metacognitive disconnect where what students like and think is good for them um, doesn't match what actually helps them, and that you really got to get them on board with this, um, or it can cause problems. Okay, I think I have like 30 seconds left or so. Um, so just very briefly, um, you know, very simple message. You want to give feedback to your students. You, I would argue you want to give them at least the correct answer. And I think you should consider delaying the feedback. I think a number of data points are converging on that conclusion now. Um, Oh, it's buzzing at me, I'm out of time. Um, and then I just want to mention um, a couple challenges um, that we can talk about. And one is the size of the errors that you're dealing with here. It's a lot easier to convince someone that they have the capital of um, Australia wrong than it is to combat a misconception um, you know, about evolution, for example. Um, and so I think you know, we've been moving up in scale on these kind of things, but there's more to be done on that. Um, and the other challenge I already alluded to is this practical one, um, that you need to have students view and process the feedback. And in our online system, we, we have every web click, you know, we know everything they're doing, and it's just stunning to me how little they look at the feedback. And I will mention that, you know, there are data showing that there are benefits from looking at feedback even when you got it correct. Um, and so you really want um, students to do this. Um, and then um, the, the challenge that I'm interested in and thinking about for the future, and this kind of relates to something John talked about, is um, I think we, especially as we move to more larger technology platforms, we're going to have to move away from instructor-provided feedback because when you have huge classes, you're not going to be able to provide that kind of feedback to that many students. So John talked a little bit about the challenges of getting his students to score their own work. Um, and I think the peer-provided fee feedback, um, which is kind of the, the go-to thing that you see right now in MOOCs or in other large classes when they want people to actually write something, is something that's going to have to be tackled um, and that we don't um, currently know a lot about. And I will, I will stop there because it's still buzzing at me.